Our scripture passage this morning is from Luke chapter 7, and we're going to read verse 18 to 35. So John 7, beginning at verse 18, or I mean Luke 7, beginning at verse 18. It is on page 1603 in your pew Bibles. 1603. Otherwise, it will be up on the screens as well. <clears throat> Luke 7, beginning at verse 18. John, the Baptist's disciples, told him all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will pre prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so this is kind of what we assume. This is kind of the way that we think. Great ones in the faith are not supposed to have doubts, right? Great ones in the faith aren't supposed to show any weakness. We all have those whom we consider great ones of the faith in our lives. At least I would expect that most of us do. I believe that there are some great ones of the faith sitting next to you today. But, you know, the way we think about it, the way that we usually perceive these people is, is like I said, great ones aren't supposed to have doubts. Great ones of the faith aren't supposed to falter, at least not publicly. Maybe, maybe in the deep, dark privacy of their own homes once in a while, but they're not supposed to falter, especially publicly. But as we see here, as we he see here in Scripture, sometimes the great ones do drop their guard and admit uncertainty and discouragement. 
And this seems to be what happens here with John, who is a great one, according to even Jesus. And I would ask you this morning, as we are now about a third of the way through this gospel, almost, are you sure about Jesus? Do you believe that he is who he says he is? Do you believe that you can base your whole hope, the entire hope of your life on him and that he won't let you down? Now, I'm not asking if you're a skeptic. John wasn't a skeptic. He was a believer. But, you know, things had happened to him in his life. Things had unfolded in such a way that his faith came to a point where it was shaken, tested. So I ask again, are you absolutely sure about Jesus? Or have circumstances in your own lives planted seeds of doubt in your mind? These are the questions I'd like you to just ponder as we talk about what we find here in our text this morning. Now, we first encountered John in chapter 3. And here's just a reminder. John the Baptist said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, Oh, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Listen to this. The axe is at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John was pretty blunt. He was single-minded, he was powerful, he was unapologetic, and his message was one of imminent judgment. Judgment is coming, judgment is coming soon. The axe is at the root of the tree. The axe is at the root of the tree, and in response to that, He called people to repentance from the most powerful to the least in society. He was fearless in preaching repentance to all who would listen. Now, only months before, when Jesus had come to the Jordan to be baptized, John proclaimed, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And so he announced Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah, and that now, with the Messiah's coming, judgment would come as well, and all would be put right. That's what John thought. That's what John thought. The time has come. But then suddenly, suddenly, John found himself behind bars, incarcerated by a by a wicked and and petty tyrant. We read about that in Luke 3 as well. When John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. So to say that John was discouraged is probably a, a vast understatement. I mean, this was a great and godly man whose world was falling down around his ears, and it it fell so hard that, at least in this moment, he was shaken to his core. And so he sent a couple of his followers, a couple of his disciples to Jesus, which, let me say, is very appropriate. You go to the source, right? He sent them to Jesus to ask, hey, Was I right about you? Are you the one that we've been waiting for, the Messiah? Or has my hope been misplaced? See, John's entire ministry had been about pointing to Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. And you know what? I'm hoping that this hits home, but, you know, to the people of that time, Messiah was an absolutely loaded term. 
I mean, the Messiah, all of the people's hopes were wrapped up in the Messiah. And so that is a loaded term, loaded with expectations from everyone who had ever uh, thought about or contemplated what it would be like when the Messiah finally came. Messiah is a royal title. It's It's a revolutionary title. It's a threat to the establishment title. And yet... In John's situation, and probably what he was thinking was, you know, hey, it's, it's the establishment that runs these prisons. And here is where John sits, and here is where John waits. And so we can all understand John's frustration. Because yes, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to Messiah, we have expectations, we all do. It's not just the eschatological or the end thing type expectations. It's the expectations about what Jesus is going to do here and now. And let's face it, many of us are proud in thinking that we know at every given moment what's best for us. The problem with John, one that we share as well, lies in the picture that he had of the Messiah. John envisioned the Messiah coming in strength to immediately judge the unrighteous, make everything right. And it's not not necessarily the wrong picture, it's just an incomplete one. Because judgment would come. Evil, wickedness, rebellion will all be swept away. But the timeline is not what John had anticipated. The timeline isn't what John anticipated, and it's timeline that we believers often have a hard time with as well. But Jesus had work to do. Jesus had lost people to find and to save. And so John was was expecting and announcing the end, and Jesus was all about establishing a new beginning. The beginning of something brand new. But even so, I would imagine that what kept John going in prison was that at any moment, at any moment, he and his message about the kingdom would be vindicated. That the Messiah would would bring judgment to people and nations. That that the Messiah would overthrow the oppressive Roman governments. That that the, the Messiah would certainly orchestrate the release of his special messenger. After all, I gave my life to this. I gave my life to ministry and self-denial and preaching the message that God had placed on my heart in my call. But what actually happened? Time dragged on. Nothing was changing uh, on a large scale anyway because tyrants were retaining their earthly power and and those earthly empires remained intact and, and John stayed right where he was out of commission in a prison cell. He needed assurance. He needed an assurance that only Jesus could provide. And when it comes down to it, Jesus did provide that assurance in two ways. The first way that Jesus provided assurance was through signs. We read about that in verse 21. At that very time, as John's disciples came to ask Jesus their questions... At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So Jesus performs these signs and wonders in the presence of John's disciples. And it's a show of great power. He has power over illness and disability. It's also a show of great authority. He has power over demons as well. But I want to point out that these signs were not an end in themselves, and and Jesus' miracles never are. 
The miracles that we find in the Bible always have a greater purpose. They, they point to something else. They point to what God is doing and, and what God intends to do. And in this instance, we discover God's greater purposes in the scriptures that Jesus quotes. Yes, the words of Jesus that we find in this text geared toward John's disciples and ultimately to John are quotes from scripture. Verse 22, he says, he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now, these ideas, these words come from at least two passages in the Old Testament, and I, I want to read them for you. I want you to listen closely. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. And then Isaiah 61, verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. You know, at the time of Jesus, these passages were already uh, very clearly and widely recognized as messianic prophecies. And so through scripture, accompanied by signs and wonders, Jesus sends his message to John. He tells John's disciples to go back and report to him, first, what they have seen Jesus do, and second, what they have heard Jesus say in his quoting of these scriptures. And the purpose is clear, to assure John that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. To John's initial question, are you the one we've been waiting for? Jesus answers, yes. Yes, in this account, the gospel writer Luke takes the opportunity to prove again that Jesus is the real deal. And he offers a personal word of encouragement to John and to us as well. Verse 23, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Which tells us a couple of things. First, that those who are able to keep the faith in Jesus will be blessed. But then second, keeping the faith in Jesus is going to be challenging at times. And so time is going to pass. We're going to be tested. We're going to have moments where we feel like God perhaps isn't who we thought he was. God perhaps isn't doing things that are in my best interests. We're going to be tested. And so these words of Jesus, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me, is a word of encouragement and a word to sustain our faith as imperfect as it is. In that statement, I think Jesus reveals to John that the purposes of God certainly would be accomplished, but that they would be accomplished in ways that no one could predict. Yes, Jesus is all about restoring Israel, but it is a different Israel than anyone was expecting. The Israel that, that Jesus was about recreating is one where people who previously had no place, like, like the blind and the lame and lepers and, and poor in spirit and even Gentiles, were now going to be welcomed in. And so Jesus is fulfilling prophecy, and Jesus is restoring Israel, and Jesus is setting priorities. And, and just as an interesting final observation of that little section, did you notice what Jesus omitted from those scripture references in his words to John? All that about freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners? Now ultimately... It will be accomplished for all who believe in Jesus Christ that we will be free of all that enslaves us. 
But I think Jesus' message to John is quite clear in a personal way that immediately it wasn't going to go that way for John. But now, see, we come to my favorite part of the passage. After John's disciples left, Jesus turns to the crowd who was, who was very interested, knowing both Jesus and John, in Jesus' relationship to John. And Jesus says some remarkably kind and generous things about John in verses 24 to 28. It says, after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. <clears throat> so what does Jesus do? Jesus validates John and John's message. John had, had accepted the prophetic call to, to prepare the way for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And, and as we mentioned before, he had stayed on point. He made no compromises. He remained faithful. And so Jesus doesn't want the crowd to draw wrong conclusions from the interaction that he just had between himself and John's disciples. So he says, what did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Someone who tailors his message to suit his hearers? Someone who shapes what he says to, to fit the culture? No. No, that's not what you went out there to see. That's not a message that changes anything. That's, that's not a message that transforms. There's no... There's nothing compelling or, or hopeful in that message in, in telling people what they want to hear. And so Jesus lifts John up and praises him for being faithful to his task and also faithful to the message that he was sent to give. And then in verse 28, he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet no one who is least, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So Jesus speaks of John as the, the greatest prophet that ever lived. And many in the crowd loved what Jesus said about John because they too respected John. But I also want you to understand what an act of kindness this was on Jesus' part. I mean, here is his servant John, and his servant John's faith is being tested. This is not John's finest hour. Even so, Jesus turns to the multitudes, and, and you know what he does? He brags on John. He brags on John. He says, let me tell you about John. There's never been a man that walked the face of the earth greater than him, my friend, my servant, my forerunner, John. He's a man of integrity. He's fearless. He's bold. He even stands up and opposes tyrants. He tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. This man belongs to God. And so what Jesus says is absolutely true. And you know, it struck me really late in the week this week. I was kind of dull earlier in the week. Ended up like rewriting huge swaths of my sermon. It didn't occur to me until late in the week that this, that this could be seen as a picture of judgment day for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. For everyone who believes that he lived and died and rose again to save us from our sins. Because this, this is what the Lord Jesus is going to do for you on judgment day. Do you understand that? You will find yourself before the throne, the judgment seat of God the Father, 
And Jesus is going to stand up and say to the, the whole gathered world, let me tell you about my servants who I love. This is a foreshadowing of the final vindication for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. And it's not that our faith is so great. I mean, even the great ones have some uncertainty and doubt. And it's not because we've done such wonderful things, because that's not at all what God's salvation plan is about. We who believe will be vindicated because our Savior is great. Because our Savior has done all the work that we could not do on our own, and because he is kinder to us than we could ever deserve. On the day of judgment, it's not going to be about our goodness and our greatness. It's going to be about his goodness and his greatness and his grace, which is more than sufficient for God to accomplish his purposes in and for us. But now we come to the final section. I wish, you know, I wish I could end there. I wish I could just assume. I wish I could just assume and end there. But now we come to the final, final section. And what Jesus teaches here actually divides his hearers. Divided his hearers then, divides, divides his hearers now. Verses 29 to 30. All the people, even the tax collectors, the sinners, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. See, Jesus knows that his audience is mixed with regard to genuine faith. Those who sincerely repented and believed and those who refused to do so. And so he, I think, graciously gives them a warning and a promise. And he points to the history of Israel, noting how prophet after prophet came to preach repentance to Israel and were time and time again ignored or persecuted. And so his warning is clear. Hey, whoever hears these words, do not make that mistake. And so in a sense, even though the timeline is different from what John imagined or what John expected, Jesus kind of reintroduces that urgency that John spent his whole ministry honoring. There is urgency here. No, 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 don't just go home and mull things over and forget about it after a day or two. This is the most important thing in your life. This is the most important decision that you can make. Do not make the mistake of those who have come before you that have not taken the call to repentance and belief seriously. If there's no repentance, if there's no if forgiveness uh, is not our highest priority in this life, then we are never going to find God's way and God's purpose. We're never going to recognize his Messiah or his kingdom, and that's the bad news. It's the bad news. But here's the promise for all those who do repent and believe. Verse 35, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? It means that for those of us who don't fall away, who remain strong even in our admittedly imperfect faith, for we who are least in the kingdom of heaven, we will be living proof of God's wisdom for all eternity. His justice and mercy, his grace and his love, and we will be blessed in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's pray.